Psalms before us. And it has a very unique design and message that you're not going to notice unless you read it from beginning to end. Now to see how the book of Psalms is designed, it's actually most helpful to start at the end. The book concludes with five poems of praise to the God of Israel, and each one begins and ends with the word hallelujah, which is Hebrew for a command to tell a group of people to praise Yah, which is short for the divine name Yahweh. Now, that's a really nice five-part arrangement, and it looks like someone's giving us a conclusion here to the book. So, it invites the question, does the book have any other signs of intentional design? If you pay attention to the headings of the poems, you'll notice that at five places, your Bible translators have the heading book one, book two, book three, four, and five at various points, and that these divide the book into five large sections. Now, the reason for this is that the final poem in each of those sections have a very similar ending that looks like an editorial edition. It reads something like, may the Lord, the God of Israel, be blessed forever and ever, amen and amen. So the book has a conclusion, it has an internal organization into five main parts, and so the natural place to go from here is now the beginning, to look for an introduction, and what do we find? Psalms 1 and 2, which stand outside of book 1 because most of the poems in book 1 are linked to David, except Psalms 1 and 2, which are anonymous. Psalm 1 celebrates how blessed the person is who meditates on the Torah, prayerfully reading it day and night, and then obeying it. Now, the word Torah simply means teaching, and more specifically, it came to refer to the five books of Moses that begin the Old Testament. And here, actually, the word seems to be used with both meanings in mind, which explains why it has five main parts. The book of Psalms is being offered as a new Torah that will teach God's people the lifelong practice of prayer as they strive to obey God's commands given in the first Torah. Psalm 2 is a poetic reflection on God's promise to King David from 2 Samuel chapter 7, that one day a messianic king would come and establish God's kingdom over the world, defeat evil and rebellion among the nations. Now Psalm 2 concludes by saying that all those who take refuge in the messianic king will be blessed, precisely the word used to open Psalm 1. And so together, these two poems tell us that the book of Psalms is designed to be the prayer book of God's people as they strive to be faithful to the commands of the Torah as they hope and wait for the future messianic kingdom. Now with these two themes introduced, we can start to see how the smaller books have been designed as well around these two ideas. So for example, book one has right at the center a collection of poems, Psalms 15 through 24, that opens and closes with a call to covenant faithfulness. And then, Psalm 16 to 18, we find a depiction of David as a model of this kind of faithfulness. So he calls out to God to deliver him, and God elevates him as king. Now, in the corresponding set of poems, Psalms 20 to 23, the David of the past has become an image of the messianic king of the future, who will also call out to God, he will be delivered, and then given a kingdom over the nations. And then right at the center of this collection is a poem, Psalm 19, dedicated to praising God for the Torah. So here we go. The two themes from Psalms 1 and 2 are bound together tightly here. Book 2 opens with two poems that are united in their hope for a future return to the temple in Zion. And this is an image closely associated with the hope of the Messianic kingdom. Then book 2 closes with a poem that depicts the future reign of the Messianic king over all of the nations. This poem's really amazing because it echoes all these other passages from the prophets about the messianic kingdom. And it concludes by saying that this king's reign will bring about the fulfillment of God's ancient promise to Abraham to bring God's blessing to all of the nations. Book three also concludes with a poem reflecting on God's promise to David, but this time in light of Israel's exile. So the poet remembers how God said he would never abandon the line of David. But now he's looking at Israel's rebellion and its result in destruction and exile and the downfall of the line of David. And so the poet ends by asking God to never forget his promise to David. Book four is designed to respond to this crisis of exile. So the opening poem returns us back to Israel's roots. 
concludes with a prayer of Moses, and he does what he did on Mount Sinai after the golden calf incident, which is to call upon God to show mercy. The center of Book 4 is dominated by a group of poems that announce that the Lord, the God of Israel, reigns as the true king of the world, and that all creation, trees, mountains, rivers, are all summoned to celebrate that future day when God will bring his justice and kingdom over all the world. Book five opens with a series of poems that affirm that God hears the cries of his people and will one day send the future king to defeat evil and bring God's kingdom. This book also contains two larger collections, one called the Hollow and the other called the Songs of Ascents. Each one of these collections concludes with a poem about the future messianic kingdom. And these two collections together, they sustain the hope for a future Exodus-like act of God to redeem his people. And then, right between them, is Psalm 119. It's the longest poem in the book. It's an alphabet poem. Each line begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it explores the wonder and the gift of the Torah as God's word to his people. So here we go. The themes from Psalm 1 and 2, Torah and Messiah, combine all together here in Book 5 which brings us all the way back to that five-poem conclusion. In the center poem, Psalm 148, all creation is summoned to praise the God of Israel because he has, quote, raised up a horn for his people. Now the horn here, it's a metaphor of a bull's horn raised in victory. And this image echoes back to the same image used in Hannah's song for Samuel chapter 2, but also to the earlier Psalm 132. The horn is a symbol for the future messianic king and his victory over evil. It's a fitting conclusion to this amazing book. Now here's one more thing that you are likely going to miss if you don't read this book in order. There's lots of different kinds of poems in the book of Psalms, but they all basically fall into two big categories, either poems of lament or poems of praise. Poems of lament express pain, confusion, and anger about how horrible the world is and how horrible the things are happening to the poet. And so these poems draw attention to what's wrong in the world, and they ask God to do something about it. There's a lot of these in the book, which tells us something important, that lament is an appropriate response to the evil that we see in our world. But what you'll notice is that lament poems predominate earlier in the book, in books one through three. But pay attention, because you'll see praise poems occasionally too. Praise poems are poems of joy and celebration, and they draw attention to what's good in the world, and they retell stories of what God has done in our lives and thank God for it. In books four and five, you'll notice that praise poems come to outnumber lament poems, and it all culminates in that five-part hallelujah conclusion. So this shift from lament to praise, this is profound, and it tells us something about the nature of prayer. As we hope for the messianic kingdom, as the book teaches us to do, this will create tension for us as we look out on the tragic state of our world and of our lives. And so the Psalms teach us not to ignore the pain of our lives, but at the same time, biblical faith is forward-looking, looking to the promise of God's future messianic kingdom. And so Torah and Messiah, lament and praise, faith and hope, that's what the book of Psalms is all about. Scripture reading today is God's Word is in Hebrews 12, 28 through 29. <clears throat> Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So be it. No children's church. Steve's going, no, Rona's not here. 
Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we can come and worship you, Lord, that we do have the hope of a kingdom in heaven, a kingdom with you that nothing can ever take away from us, a kingdom that is perfect because it was bought with the price of Jesus' blood. Lord, as we read your word today and study your scriptures, help us to bring that to heart, to love you with all of our hearts, to serve you as the, as the King of all kings and Lord of all lords, because you alone would send your Son to save us. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you didn't understand from that Psalms, and you got a new challenge, go back through and read Psalms in, in order now that it's in the Bible. We're reading them in chronological order. Maybe you've discovered that, and that's enlightening. Because you'll see, you'll read from Samuel or wherever you're reading from and see that David's hiding in the caves, and then you'll read Psalms that were obviously written because of that and, and looking to God for His stronghold and His fortress and everything. But... <clears throat> You'll see, like the video says, that, you, that it comes from a source of lamenting to a source of praise. <laughs> we just had Easter, the resurrection. We thought that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was crucified, buried, and dead. Hopes were lost. Was this Jesus truly the one who said He was? All these mighty miracles that He performed and everything else, could He be the Son of God that He could be killed by man? But see, He wasn't killed by man. He laid down His life to save us. And then when they went to that tomb, what did they find? <laughs> An empty tomb, for He is risen. And that is what our foundation is based upon, that, that Jesus Christ is our King. Now, here's something to think of. Every kingdom has a king, right? And everyone else besides the king is subject to the king. Yeah, think about that. So let's think about that. And we read that verse from Hebrews. If you look in your bulletin, I had one from the message that said it this way. In Hebrews 12, 28 and 29, Do you see what you've got? You've got an unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship. Deeply reverent before God, for God is not an indifferent bystander. He's actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to be burned, and He won't quit until it's all cleansed. Praise God that He is a consuming fire. Heaven is going to be perfect, and you have a home there if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that if you believe that in your heart and that you profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that means that He's Lord of your life. If you didn't take this challenge, I've got so many challenges for you. I'm looking at Mark when I say it. Um, we're going to go over some of those things today. This is pretty easy. This is 40 days worth of just a few scriptures. Starting with the first 19 days are things that Jesus said to his disciples after he was risen. Okay? And then from day 20 on, we are, I went back to what his first teachings were so that we can see what he talked about because Jesus stayed on earth for 40 days after his resurrection to do something. Scripture says it was to teach us more about the kingdom of God. He had already done that, but see, now the fact that we know that Jesus Christ is who He says He is without a shadow of a doubt because He Himself raised from the dead, we have a little different perspective on things. So in Luke chapter 24, and this is one of the things in your reading, starting in verse 36, it says, While they were still talking about this, Jesus Himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Because see, if you know without a shadow of doubt that God's only Son died for you and that He rose again, you can have peace. Peace in every single circumstance that will ever face you in this life. We watched a movie Friday, Paul the Apostle of Christ, and it was different than what I thought the movie would be. Most of the time he was, well, all the time he was just in prison. Well, that's where a lot of his letters were written, weren't, weren't they? And he had the peace in that movie. And he projected that peace to Luke so Luke would go on and write. He projected that peace to others who wanted to stamp out the persecution they were facing. See, we forget about the early church. 
The early church was heavily persecuted for professing Jesus Christ. They were captured, they were taken and put into the games as sport and killed by lions, run through with a sword. Their bodies were even taken and put up on the public streets to light as lamp posts for professing Jesus Christ. And we're scared to profess Jesus Christ because it might cost us some ridicule or maybe even our job. They knew what they had, the hope that they had for the future kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And that's why Jesus stayed around talking to them so that they would have that peace and that confidence. Verse 37 of Luke 24 says, They were startled and frightened, thinking that he was a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why, why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bone as you see that I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet, and wh while they still did not believe it. Now there's why I said last week that I think Thomas has a bum rap because he gets called Doubting Thomas. Because we see right here that the 11 didn't believe. Thomas wasn't here with them then. They said the same thing that Thomas said. But Thomas gets the bad rap on it, doesn't he? They didn't believe. Thomas says later in John 20, verse 24 through 28, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, <coughs> one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the disciples told him this. The disciples told him about these convincing proofs that, that Acts says that Jesus stayed around and gave them. He says, we have seen the Lord. Not we've seen Jesus, not we've seen our teacher. We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in his side, he's simply saying that unless I can experience what you experience, then I won't believe. Okay? Verse 26, a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with, was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you again. Said the same thing again. Then he said to Thomas, because he knew what Thomas had said before, and he knew Thomas wasn't there. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And those words are to every one of us. We do doubt. We do wonder. We don't have burning bushes. We, don't, we have the Spirit of God inside us, but we still question from time to time our beliefs when the world tells us, oh, Jesus is not the only way. There's plenty of ways. Oh, it really doesn't matter. It matters how good you live. And, and you know what? You're not good enough. All these doubts that Satan puts in your mind because he walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But if you know Jesus Christ as the Son of God, you know that He rose from the dead, and you profess that, and you read His Word, the Spirit will comfort you and teach you about Jesus, who will teach you about God. Thomas said, My Lord, and then he even added, And my God, because he would worship Jesus Christ for who He was. For 40 days, a week has passed here, for 40 days total, Jesus stayed teaching those who would choose to believe, who would choose to become His disciples, to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after Him. He continued to teach them things about the kingdom of heaven. The first verse that you start off with is Acts 1.3. It says, After His suffering, after the time came when Jesus died and was buried, and He raises again from the dead... He presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. If you saw somebody that you watched brutally killed and laid in a tomb and then walking around fully alive and even walking through doors and stuff, but you could touch them afterwards, you kind of know that they have the power of God. So you have to accept either what Jesus said is truth 100% truth or that he was a liar and a lunatic. And Jesus said that he was God himself. And he said the only way to the Father was through him. But he gave many pr convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. And what did he do? He spoke about the kingdom of God. 
Why did Jesus stay around 40 days? Any kind of time period would be fine, but he stayed around with ample time teaching them more. Remember, the Holy Spirit's not here yet, residing in them. That comes at day 50, if you've got your facts right. That comes at Pentecost. He even tells them after he leaves and ascends into heaven, he says, not yet. He says, still go wait and see. To pray and seek God. So they're doing that without the Holy Spirit in them. And each and every one of you have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you if you, in fact, believe. You are sanctified, set apart, justified, made holy. You are a child of God. You are a priest carrying out the message of telling the world about reconciliation to God through Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord. So what did he do during those 40 days? He gave them convincing proofs. What did he teach during those 40 days? More about the kingdom of God. About this kingdom that Psalms talks about. About this time that we're reading about, about the time of kings. All of this Old Testament pointing to the true King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Because a man can never save us, but the God-man, Jesus Christ, who was fully God and fully man, will save you from your sins for all eternity if you believe in Him and put your trust in Him. Back in Luke 24, we read in verse 41, And while they still did not believe, it was because of joy and amazement. He asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish he took and ate in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me. Everything that we're reading in the Old Testament, if you're looking at it through the eyes and lens of Jesus Christ as a child of God, you'll see that it's talking about Jesus. Because we have a corrupt, sinful world, you and I, who cannot get to God, who deserve His wrath, the wrath of God Almighty for disobeying that king in that kingdom. But instead, He loves us enough that He would give us His Son, the prince of the kingdom, the heir to the throne. He would give Him over to be sacrificed for us to draw us into the kingdom. All that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So as you're reading through the Psalms, have you noticed that? Have you noticed them foretelling? Especially the prophecy that's in there that describes Jesus' death and everything. How could it be talking about anyone else? But these psalms are continually taking us from a point of lamenting and sorrow and shame to a point of praising God for what a glorious, mighty God He is. Despite of all of our continued sin and failures, we just keep making things worse. But God is faithful and just, and He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Wow. Everything in the Old Testament says that we are doomed except for the fact that God would send His only Son, Jesus Christ. Wow, what a reason. The songs that we sang this morning, everything that we were reading in these verses, what a reason we have to praise God. Jesus died for your sins and was raised so that you would have life. Scripture says abundant life. Not just in heaven, but here now. So that you can have peace. The first thing that Jesus came was said, Peace be with you. You're going to continue here. You're going to be my hands and feet. I have a mission for you. All that I was teaching you for was so that you could proclaim about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And you will have peace in this world even though you face sufferings. If you didn't see the movie, you need to see the movie. Because the peace that Paul and Luke had was so amazing. Because it showed the, uh, some of the others, some of them had peace, some of them didn't. It showed how they were scared for their lives, literally. Because they might be thrown to the lions and the sword or they might be lit up on the street as a human torch. But still they proclaim Jesus Christ if they truly believed. Man, what a thing to look at and, and humble ourselves for the freedom that we have in Christ in this world to tell others. We are so blessed to proclaim His Word boldly right now. Are you doing that? You cannot believe and, not, and be saved and be born again unless 
you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. He has to be Lord. And as Lord, He has given us a commandment to go to preach and teach and make disciples thereof, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow after Him. There is no other way, no other truth, and no other life. Back to reading in Luke 24, and by the way, I'm catching you up with the first, so if you need a sheet, you'll be caught up with the first of the week. We're doing most of these verses, so you've got no excuse. Okay? Verse 45 through 53. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sin will be preached in His name to all nations. What if they said, I don't need to preach. I don't need to do that. I'm, I'm saved and I know it. I can sit here and I'm fine. Well, that's what many Christians do today. You know, I listen to Moody some and I listen to some of the polls and they talk about how many people have, have told someone about Jesus Christ in this year, in a calendar year, and less than half of them have told one person about Jesus Christ. What's wrong with the church? Do you not have the joy and peace? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord? Because if you don't, you don't know Him as your Savior. And on that day, many will come to him and say, did we not know you? And he said, depart from me, I do not know you. But we did mighty miracles in your name. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth on that day because they thought for sure they were going to be a part of that kingdom. But they weren't. Make sure Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior of your life. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sin will be preached in His name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Verse 48, You are witnesses to these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When He had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, He lifted up His hands and blessed them. While He was blessing them, He left and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped Him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. This is without the Holy Spirit being present in them like we have. They were doing what we don't do so many times without the Spirit of God inside of us prompting us to do that. They stayed in continual worship and stayed in continually in joy. Verse 53, And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. <laughs> We meet one time a week, maybe two or three if we're, if we're really vigorous Christians, right? And when they met, it might be the last time they ever breathed because if someone found out about them, they might be killed. When we went to see the movie with the uh, Trek kids, I told them about John Bunyan. He was, he was imprisoned for 12 years because he had a prayer meeting with more than five individuals. And he would have been allowed to leave prison if he would have simply denounced Jesus Christ as his Lord. But instead he was imprisoned, taken from his family for 12 years. But just like Paul, we have Pilgrim's Progress and many more things. So please tell your children about that because they won't hear about it otherwise. It will be censored and they will hear about Harry Potter and things like that instead. Definitely. So teach your children. Train them up. Tell them about Jesus Christ and what He means, the joy and the peace that you have as a result. So what does your Christian life look like? Do you continually gather together? Do you rejoice in praise? Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Do you feed your spirit more than you feed your face? Hmm. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus says, Whoever acknowledges me before others, will also acknowledge, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disown me, disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Now you can take that however you mean it. I'm just quoting Scripture. <laughs> After Peter had proclaimed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah in Mark, Jesus says this, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I think you've heard that before somewhere. 
For whoever wants to save their life, well, they'll lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel's sake will save it. What good is it if someone gained the whole world, the kingdom of earth, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His Father's glory with the holy angels. One other thing that you can be as sure of from the resurrection, if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, if He said, you're my hands and feet in this earth, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light, don't hide your light. If He said all those things, He also said, I will return and I will bring my reward with me. You can count on the fact that Jesus Christ will return and we will give an account to Him as King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Your life never belonged to you in the first place. Someone created you. God Almighty created you. If He created you, He created you for His purpose, His intent, His design, His desire, His glory, His praise. <laughs> but then when we rebelled, instead of us throwing us away, He let His Son come, suffer, and die to restore us back. Our lives have been purchased back. If my God and my King would come and die for me, how much more do I have to give Him but my life? And that's nothing in comparison. So why would I ever not want to proclaim Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world? Paul writes this in Romans 10 verses 8 through 10. But what does it say? What does the Old Testament say? What does salvation say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, do you see it again? And believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. You have to have that proclamation of faith. That's why the first, we'll discover that when we're reading through chronologically, that James was the first letter written most likely. It was written to a bunch of people who said, I believe, but had no actions, no deeds that justified their belief. It was only lip service. Oh, I praise Him with my mouth, but that's where it ends. What if you get lip service from your kids? Right? You know it's lip service. You don't, that doesn't honor you. That doesn't do a thing for you. How much more does our lip service to God bring us shame instead of bringing Him glory and praise? But if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Christians, how much more should we profess and praise than the people that wrote these psalms? They only had a shadow, a glimpse of what was to come. We've experienced God's love through His Son dying for us so that we might live. If you read through your readings in Psalm 78, and I'm going to read from the easy-to-read easy to version there's Bibles in your pews now where you can read those as well. Well, excuse me, common, common English is in your pews. This is easy reading version, okay? I'm getting you all confused with all these different ones, but they tell the same story. The reason I picked this one is it was really very easy to read when I read it. Psalm 78, if you read that this week, you should have, is a history to tell us again, like Paul said in the letter to the Corinthians, don't forget these things are there so that you'll learn, that you'll learn from your history not to make the same mistakes. And what you learn from your history, again, is like I said, that we're desperately lost, desperately wicked, desperately in need of someone to save us. And we know who that is, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the one that would die for me so that I might live my life for Him. 
And in Psalm 78 in the easy reading version, it says it this way. My people, listen to my teachings. Listen to what I say. I will tell you a story. Maybe yours says a parable. Huh? Which is what Jesus taught in, in, right? I will tell you about things from the past that are hard to understand. We have heard the story and we know it well. Our fathers told it to us. And we will not forget it. Our people will be telling this story to the last generation. We will all praise the Lord and tell about the amazing things He did. He made an agreement with Jacob. He gave the law to Israel. He gave the commands to our ancestors. He told them to teach the law to their children. Then the next generation, even the children not yet born, would learn the law. And they would be able to teach it to their own children. So they would all trust in God, never forgetting what He had done and always obeying His commands. Does it sound like we, what we read in Exodus and Deuteronomy and Joshua? They would not be like their ancestors who were stubborn and refused to obey. Their hearts were not devoted to God and they were not faithful to Him. Well, we know what happens time and time again. Israel turned from God. But God was always faithful. He was always there. He did discipline His children. But He always heard their cries at the right moment. And at just the right moment, Jesus Christ came to the, into this world to die for our sins. Don't ever think that God has forsaken you, but always hold firmly to the faith that you profess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you believe in Him, you have an eternity in the kingdom of heaven. And nothing can shake that because it's a firm foundation. Verse 9 says, The men from Ephraim had their weapons, but they ran from battle. They did not keep their agreement with God. They refused to obey His teaching. They forgot the great things He had done and the amazing things He had shown them. Song goes on to tell about things in Egypt and in the desert, so I'm going to skip down to verse 17. But they continued sinning against Him. They rebelled against God Most High in the desert. Then they decided to test God by telling Him to give them the food they wanted. They complained about Him and said, Can God give us food in the desert? Yes, He struck the rock and a flood of water came out, but can He give us bread and meat? The Lord heard what they said and became angry with Jacob's people. He was angry with Israel, his children. Why? Because they weren't content with the things they had. Oop, that doesn't sound familiar, does it? The church in the United States today. We have so much. We should be setting this country on fire for Jesus. Instead, the gospel message is prospering more in undeveloped countries who see they need a Savior and a Lord, where they don't hold on to the things of this world and worship those foolish, worthless idols instead of worshiping the Lord their God. Verse 22, Because they did not trust in Him, they did not believe that God could save them. Do you trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation? Do you truly trust in Him that He is Lord of all and that you will give your life up for Him? I'm skipping down to verse 30. But before they were fully satisfied, while the food was still in their mouths, God became angry and killed even the strongest of them. Don't think you're standing firm because you might fall. He brought down Israel's best young men, but the people continued to sin. They did not trust in the amazing things God could do, so He ended their worthless lives. When Jesus talks about living a life of worth over and over and over again, and to do that, you must become the least of these to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He brought their years to, to a close with disaster. When He killed some of them, the others would turn back to Him. They would come running back to God. They would remember that God was their rock, they would remember that God, that God Most High had saved them. But they tried to fool Him with their words. Lip service. They told Him lies instead. Because if you're not praising God and it's not the truth, that you are my God, my rock, and my fortress, then it's only lip service and it is in fact a lie. 
And the devil is the father of all lies. He might just be the one that's leading you to say that. Please, please make Jesus Christ your Lord. Verse 37, their hearts were not really with him. They were not faithful to the agreement he gave them. Are you being faithful to the new covenant? The covenant written in Jesus' blood? The covenant that if you truly believe in Him and profess with your mouth that you will spend an eternity with Him when He returns? Verse 38, But God was merciful. He forgave their sins and did not destroy them. Many times He held back His anger. He never let it get out of control. He remembered that they were only people like a wind that blows and then is gone. In the movie... Paul gave an analogy. A lot of his things that he said, you're like, oh, that's Scripture, that's Scripture, that's where it came from. Oh, you could see in your mind that that's what Paul said at that time, and then Luke wrote it down and, and so forth. It was neat to envision it that way. But he said one thing that I don't find in Scripture anywhere, but it was a neat uh, analogy. He said, have you ever been sailing? And you reach down, you're out in the middle of the ocean, and all you can see all the way around you is all this water. That's all you see. And you scoop down in your hands and you pull up this water as you watch it flee from your hands till it's all gone. He said the problem is, is most men concentrate on this, this life, when the sea of eternity is out there, the kingdom of heaven. And instead of living for that sea that's all that you can see, they stay focused and live on this till it's run out and you have no more time left to live for God. Man, that spoke. Because we do that. We don't learn. We keep ourselves on the throne. We stay focused on other things. We don't trust in God to give us our daily bread, to forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Not my will, but thine, O Lord. Verse 52. Then he led Israel like a shepherd. He led his people like sheep in the desert. He guided them safely. They had nothing to fear. He drowned their enemies in the sea. He led his people to the Holy Land, to the mountain he took with his own power. He forced the other nations out before them and gave each family its share of the land. He gave each tribe of Israel a place to live. But they tested God most high and made him very sad for they didn't obey His commands. They had a promised land, a land of milk and honey. We have an eternal kingdom in heaven where Jesus will wipe every tear from our eye. There will be no more pain, no more sin, no more suffering, no more death. What are we living our lives for? Are we living it for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who gave His life for us. In Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to read from the easy to read version again, the verses before the scripture that Merle read this morning and ending up there. So I'm going to start in verse 24 of Hebrews chapter 12. You have come to Jesus, the one who brought the new agreement from God to His people, you have come to the sprinkled blood that tells us about better things than the blood of Abel. Be careful and don't refuse to listen when God speaks. Those people refused to listen to Him when He warned them on earth, and they did not escape. Now God is speaking from heaven, so now it will be worse for those who refuse to listen to Him. Because He sacrificed His Son for us if we have failed to obey Him and obey His commands, how much more severe is His wrath going to be? Verse 26, When He spoke before, His voice shook the earth. But now He has promised, Once again I will shake the earth, but I will also shake heaven. The words once again clearly show us that everything that was created will be destroyed. That is the things that can be shaken. And only what cannot be shaken will remain. So we should be thankful because we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And because we are thankful, we should worship God in a way that will please Him. 
We should do this with respect and fear because our God is a fire that can destroy us. When I read those words, it reminded me of Hebrews 11.7. You've heard me say it some because it is one of my biggest motto verses right now. That was out of holy fear Noah built an ark to save his family. And that's what got us discussing Noah's ark the other day. We don't know how long it took, <laughs> but it took a long time. When we pray, we want to see immediate results or we think God's not with us. He's against us. But that's not what Scripture says. He's with us so we can have peace in those times because we will have pain and suffering in this world. If we want our kids to have a firm foundation and walk in His ways and be in heaven with us, then we need to dedicate our lives to it. Not teach them for a short period of time and then say, oh, they've rebelled. We need to teach them every single day and show them every single day, not just give lip service. Out of holy fear, we need to take whatever amount of time it takes to build an ark for safety for them so that they will believe in Jesus Christ and profess Him with their mouth that He is Lord. When I read those words, I'm like, i got to go back and look at the, the root word. And the root word in Hebrews 12, 28, and 29 there was eulabia. It's a noun that speaks of holy fear to God for who He is. The reverence and awe, amazement and wonder due to God just because of His power and might. And then I said, well, what's the word used in Hebrews eleven seven? It's eulabeama. It's the verb part of that. It's doing that. <laughs> it's not just giving him lip service. It's doing it. Giving my life, no matter how long it takes to tell others about Jesus Christ so that some will come to salvation. Not my job to save them. That's the Holy Spirit that will convict them. But it is my job to be the hands and feet of Jesus to let my light shine before others that they may see my good works, my good deeds, my love, my charity, my grace, my mercy, my forgiveness of trespasses <laughs> that they've done so that it will glorify my Father in heaven and maybe they'll come to know Him. Is Jesus Lord of your life? If He's not, all you've got to do is say, Jesus, be my Lord today. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you because you are a mighty, mighty God. We thank you for your word that teaches us, that shows us that, that there's no way that we could ever be righteous, that we could be saved. But because of our faith in Jesus Christ alone, our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. And we can cry out to you as our Father, our daddy in heaven. We thank you and praise you that you are a God worthy of praise and honor. And we also sing praises to the lamb that was slain for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.